Hello, and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Home Discovery Series. Today's program is Wonders of Wildflowers with Dr. Chris Sackey, Kutztown University ecologist. Hi, Jamie, how are you? Great, and thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. Um, oh, thanks, I'm glad to be here. Wonderful. My name is Jamie Dawson. I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, and we are so glad that you are joining us today. Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey, and we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit, and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, thank you so very much for your continued support. If you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges, and we are thrilled to offer our community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, viewers may submit questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. We've designated time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And we are so excited that Dr. Chris Sackey is joining us today to teach us about some beautiful native wildflowers and other plants that can be found at Hawk Mountain and surrounding areas. Before we get started, I'd love to share some of Chris's background experience with our audience. Chris is a faculty member in biology at Kutztown University. He is a plant ecologist who has studied plant reproductive ecology of several native species in natural and in cultivated landscapes over a number of years. He was a curator of the State Arboretum of Virginia for eight years before coming to Kutztown. At the Arboretum, he learned about the ornamental and environmental value of native plant species in home landscapes. And Chris, you know that we love our native plants at Hawk Mountain. Oh, so, <laughs> we sure do. Yes, so how did you become interested in the field of plant ecology? So mostly there was a significant influence from my family where we took vacations when I was a kid. So I don't think I really knew the names of plants, but just enjoyed being outdoors. Then when I went to college, had a very influential uh, ecology faculty member who let me know that you could, you, know, you could make a living, you could actually study nature and you could study ecology as you know, a, a way of trying to understand the world. And you could do that as a profession. So then I went to graduate school and while a graduate student uh, at Rutgers University first, I found that there was a great deal of interest in plant-animal interactions and that stimulated my interest to look further at how plants respond to animals. And then from there, I, I focus a lot on plant-animal interactions still, but I also focus on plant reproductive biology. Thank you so much for sharing that. And can you also share a little bit about your personal connection to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary? Okay, so I've been at Kutztown University for 21 years and made a connection at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary with Keith Bildstein. I know Lori Goodrich. Lori went to graduate school at Rutgers at the same time that I did. And so uh, I was given an opportunity to begin to give public tours. And so I bring my students to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary to do lab exercises, ecology lab exercises and plant ecology lab exercises, also for my environmental biology class. So I benefit from my relationship with Hawk Mountain, allowing me to teach my students in a, you know, beautiful, natural setting. And then also I love giving tours to uh, guests of Hawk Mountain. And we very much appreciate you doing that. So thank you very much. So I think we're all pumped up to, to learn more about wildflowers and other plants. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Chris. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and I have a PowerPoint slideshow that I'll show, but it won't be death by PowerPoint. I'll show a few word slides and then 
the rest of the program will be that you could view uh, photographs of plants and I can describe something about those plants. So my title slide, this is The Wonders of Wildflowers. It's a program that I do each spring uh, at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary in person. So I just wanted to throw a picture taken at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary saying how much I wish we could be taking a walk together. This isn't what it looks like today at Hawk Mountain. It's raining in southeastern Pennsylvania, but uh, it's just, you know, a beautiful uh, setting in which to learn about birds of prey, about wildlife in general, and then about, uh, about plants. So I just want to introduce a few terms before we get started because I'll start using terms. I'll try not to be too technical and if something comes up, just post a question and Jamie can relay that question to me to have it so that I'm not using terms that you're not familiar with. But when we talk about the plants today, we'll, I'll be referring to herbaceous plants. So usually I'll just say herbs. And these are plants that uh, are tender. They have green tops, most of which die back to the ground in the winter. And then we'll be talking quite a bit about woody plants at Hawk Mountain. And these are plants with woody above ground parts that remain alive from year to year. And I'll mention a few vines. There are woody vines. There are also herbaceous vines too. But I'm going to focus today on just one or two important woody vines. I'll talk about shrubs. Shrubs are woody plants that are probably under about 20 feet in height, under about six meters in height. And they are typically multi-stemmed. And then trees, usually people say they are 20 feet or taller, about six meters or taller, and they generally have a single trunk. So, you know, I'm going to be referring to all of those. And then, you know, just to give you an overview of what we'll discuss today, I'll, I'll talk about general ecology of plants and perhaps some of the animals that interact with plants. Um, we'll talk about plant growth and reproduction and a couple of aspects of plant biology. And with my experience having worked at the State Arboretum of Virginia and then my interest after that, I can talk about using native plants in home landscapes. And then I'll also mention some traditional human uses of plants, uh, you know, in medicines, for foods, that sort of thing. Okay, so to start too, just to help me structure uh, the conversation, when you visit an Eastern deciduous forest, in spring, you would see, you know, ecologists tend to break the forest into four layers. And there's one layer not visible here. You can see these larger trees, single trunked, but those would be the canopy trees. A canopy layer uh, would be the layer that receives the sun most directly. And there would be light that filters through the canopy trees and there would be sub canopy trees, smaller trees that even at their tallest would not reach all the way into the canopy. So these are trees that are receiving filtered light. There would be shrubs, I'm kind of circling, I don't know if you get to see my PowerPoint cursor, but shrubs are typically multi-stemmed woody plants that receive filtered light that makes it through the canopy and the sub canopy trees. And then finally, on the forest floor, there would be an herb layer. So herbaceous plants, those tender green plants. So I'm going to refer to these four layers of forest structure at times during the lecture. Okay, now this is just another shot showing uh, a canopy tree that the canopy is outside of the view. This is probably a witch hazel plant, which could be a sub canopy tree, you know, it gets to the size of a tree, but it's often multi-stemmed. And then there would be shrubs, and then there would be herbs on the forest floor. So uh, if we were walking at Hawk Mountain, we would be right now outside the visitor center. And probably the first plant I would talk about would be Eastern Hemlock, which is a tree that had been really quite abundant in Pennsylvania at one time 
Eastern hemlock is a conifer. So you can see these small cones, probably no more than an inch to two inches in length. Um, hemlocks have single needles attached directly to the stem. It's the state tree of Pennsylvania. It was declared the state tree in 1939. But, um, and you can see really quite sizable hemlocks, or you, at one time you could see a lot of very large hemlocks growing along uh, stream drainages, along river corridors. But in recent years, there has been an insect introduced uh, originally probably into Virginia, and it's an insect called the hemlock woolly adelgid. And adelgids are like aphids. They have a piercing mouth part that they can put into the, um, the plumbing of the plant, and they can draw their nutrition from that plumbing at the base of the needles proceeding into the stem of the plant. And so this hemlock woolly adelgid, over the course of perhaps five to 10 years, will be able to kill a tree. It'll become that abundant. And so if you ever travel in the Shenandoah National Park, you would see large patches of forest where hemlocks have essentially been eradicated. And they're just standing hemlocks in those forests. So there's been some work done to try to introduce uh, insects from the country from which this insect is native. It was introduced to North America on some hemlocks originally from Asia. And so there are uh, Asian species of beetles that feed on the, the adelgid and people have been working on that to see if they can control the adelgid. Okay, so that now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna proceed from the forest floor up so there is a name for plants that flower in spring. So the Wonders of Wildflower uh, presentation is usually presented at a time when these spring ephemerals, these short-lived flowering plants, short-lived in terms of their period of flowering. So this would be mayapple. Mayapple uh, has an umbrella-like leaf, but when individuals flower, there would be a forked leaf. You can see possibly this fork in the leaves and you can see this open flower. And then mayapple would produce a fruit, you know, a berry that has lots of seeds in it. And this fruit would mature probably in late June. It would be kind of tucked beneath the leaves and would probably be eaten by deer, probably eaten by um, even turtles, I've read accounts of feeding on the fruit, but the fruit is supposed to be sickeningly sweet. And there was a famous botanist named Asa Gray from Harvard who had said that mayapple fruits are suitable for pigs and young boys, and that is all. And it turns out, though, that the fruit contains a toxin. So this plant contains toxins. So if you eat the fruit before it's mature, it can really be quite harmful for you. So I don't encourage anyone to try sampling uh, without really knowing that you have a mature fruit. So maybe just avoid the fruits altogether. Um, now we're moving up in the layers. So in the shrub layer, one of the plants that's really quite abundant in certain forests in Pennsylvania, I don't find it so abundant at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, but a plant called spicebush. And if we were together, we could crush this leaf and you would get this aromatic uh, fragrance coming from the crushed leaf. And this was described as a plant that probably would have made a tea for, um, by Native Americans. Um, one thing about the flowers is that they are among the earliest flowering shrubs in Pennsylvania. So they flower during spring. And another thing that's curious about the spice bush is that it has separate male and female plants. So if you were to hike in the forest during the fall when the fruits are being produced, you would find some individuals with fruits on them, some individuals without fruits, but that is typically a result of some of the plants being male and incapable of producing fruits, and then the female plants capable of producing fruits. As uh, a wildlife plant, this is something you can grow in your home garden. And if you were able to get a female plant, 
it produces a fruit that is quite rich in lipids and oils that would make it a good nutritious plant for migratory birds during their fall migration. Okay, now we're moving up to the subcanopy. And a subcanopy tree, this is a tree that is quite abundant at Hawk Mountain. It's a tree called serviceberry. There are a number of species of serviceberry, so I'm not gonna say what species it is. Uh, the genus is Amelanchier. This would be a subcanopy tree that even at its tallest, it would not reach into the, the higher canopy. It's a plant that's in the rose family. It flowers very early, another early flowering plant in Pennsylvania. And the uh, common name for serviceberry, having attended a, uh, a fireside presentation at Shenandoah National Park several years ago, uh, the, the ranger was saying that the name serviceberry, the common name, probably arose because itinerant preachers would have uh, gone from community to community during the summers, but they would probably stop sometime in the fall when conditions became too cold to travel. And so uh, the services, the church services accompanying the itinerant preachers would probably start again in the spring at about the time when service berry was in flower. Uh, I've had guests on my tours at Hawk Mountain who have also said that they had heard that the services were actually funeral services. And with um, the inability to dig during the winter, that people who had died during the winter would be interred. And so those funeral services might be acknowledged in the, in the common name. Um, if you were to find serviceberry in the forest, it has a beautiful smooth gray bark with some striping in it. So I'm trying to show that bark here. And then one of the common names, another common name for serviceberry is Juneberry. And Juneberry, it produces an, this ripe sweet fruit. And I think I'd mentioned it's in the rose family. This plant is in the same uh, subfamily as the apples. And so if you were to eat these fruits, they're quite small, but they're very sweet and they're, but they're pretty seedy. They probably have a number of seeds inside of them. So I would think that um, I've read accounts and they said that probably people who had been deprived of fresh fruit for a long winter, you know, coming in June and having the opportunity to eat fresh fruits, probably would have collected these. They could have made pies, they could have made jellies uh, with, you know, with service berry fruits. Okay, now I'm going to move to the canopy. And the tallest trees, I'm going to select red maple as a canopy tree that could be found at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. So the red maple is widely distributed in Eastern North America. It's one of the most widely distributed trees in Eastern North America. It goes from Florida up to Southern Canada, you know, and proceeds pretty far out Kansas, you know, as far west as Kansas and then and Illinois even, and then comes to the coast. It occurs in uh, wet places. It is sometimes called swamp maple, but the soils at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary are very rocky and quite dry, but it succeeds up there too. And so uh, it's not probably the most abundant tree, or it's definitely not the most abundant tree in Hawk Mountain forests right now, but in surveying uh, seedlings with my students, in lab exercises we do, I find that it's probably the most abundant uh, plant in the, uh, in the seedling pool, indicating that perhaps this forest could change over time and be better represented by red maple in the future. Now, one of the traits of flowering trees in the Eastern United States is that many of them flower before they produce their leaves in the spring, and many of them are wind pollinated. And so I'm going to show you the, the flowers of two different maples. This is, uh, these are the flowers of box elder, which occurs right outside the visitor center at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. These are the flowers of red maple, but it turns out that maples are a bit difficult to categorize 
in terms of their pollination system. So red maple has these open flowers. They're supposed to be, you know, partly wind pollinated, but bees do visit these flowers and do gather pollen. And with the box elder, reportedly they have separate male and female plants. And with red maple, they can be really quite mixed. There can be male plants, female plants, plants that have a mix of male and female flowers. So the reproductive system is really a little bit complicated. So I've already shown you red maple. I'm going to show one picture of box elder. It's a little bit out of focus, but box elder is unusual. It's the only North American maple that has compound leaves. You can see there's a leaflet here, a leaflet here, a leaflet here, but all of this is one leaf and you could follow the structure that attaches to the stem, to the, to the stem itself. And so this one structure with three leaflets, often with five in box elder, attaches to the stem. You can also see that the, this is characteristic of all the maples, that they have opposite leaf attachments. So leaves are attached opposite one another on the stem. Box elder is interesting to me because I had said red maple was widely distributed. Box elder is distributed all across North America. So I had gone to graduate school in Arizona and I could find box elder growing along stream drainages in Arizona. And it's found in California. It's found all across North America from East Coast to West Coast. So it's a very widely distributed plant. Not, you know, doesn't typically get too large. Okay, so, oh, let me go back. Oh no, there we go. So going back to um, the herbaceous plants, I'm showing a photograph of violets. So violets are a great um, spring ephemeral with this, these beautiful flowers. And I'm here too, I'm saying Viola SPP, saying there are a number of species of violets. There could be white flowered violets, yellow flowered violets, a couple of these um, violet colored violets. But one thing that's very interesting about the violets to me is that they have also a very unusual reproductive system. They have these colorful flowers that are open to visits by small solitary bees. And these flowers are called chasmogamous flowers. So the chasm meaning an opening. And then close to ground level, usually hidden underneath leaf, leaf litter, there would be what are called cleistogamous flowers or closed flowers. And those closed flowers never open up. So they are entirely self-fertilized. So with the chasmogamous flowers, they can get visits between individual plants and they can get a mix of genetic material with pollen from other individuals coming into these open flowers. Whereas the cleistogamous flowers, they're kind of a backup reproductive system where they can set seeds. The seeds are usually a little bit smaller. They don't germinate at the same rate, but they are self-fertile and it's a backup system. If the plant doesn't set seeds by outcrossing, by chasmogamous flowers, you would also get seeds set by these closed self-fertile flowers. Now, another plant that's really great to see at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary is Indian cucumber root. And the Indian cucumber root is characterized by having a uh, kind of a, a, a whorl of leaves. And so it can be seven to nine leaves. But when the plant is in flower, it produces two whorls of leaves. So here's one, here's the second whorl, not quite so clear. But if you look, the flowers are born underneath this upper layer of leaves. And so you've got this, you know, really quite attractive uh, flower. And then once that flower is fertilized, the fruit would be set above the level of that second layer of leaves. Now, if you look just a bit to the left, if we look at on the left hand photograph and you look to the left, this is an Indian cucumber root plant but it's not going to flower this year, so it only has one layer of leaves. The Indian cucumber root part of it is that the uh, root is 
reportedly edible and has a bit of a cucumber taste to it. Um, I just remind everybody when I say something is edible, I haven't necessarily tested that myself and I don't encourage people to do it. Uh, also with a lot of plants like Indian cucumber root, they're not always so abundant in a given area. So you can negatively impact the population if you were to harvest it. So I would encourage people just to kind of enjoy it and enjoy the story of how it might be edible. Excuse me, Chris, I have, I have a question and um, came in about the Indian cucumber plant. Does it produce actual cucumbers? No, it does not. It, it, produces, it produces a below ground root that has a taste like a cucumber. Mm. So you would have to excavate it and dig up, the, dig up the, the root or probably an underground stem would be more accurate to consume that. Okay, Thank thanks, Jamie. Good question. Okay, now I want to go to woody vines just for a second, just because everybody should know what poison ivy looks like. And so uh, poison ivy is toxicodendron radicans. It can be diverse in form. It can creep over the ground. It has compound leaves. So these three leaflets are all part of one leaf in a poison ivy plant. And then you can also find poison ivy climbing on trees and it can get really quite sizable. So if you see, you know, the, the general, uh, you know, kind of wisdom is leaves of three, leave them be. Now, right next to this poison ivy plant, I want to point out that there is a plant with five leaflets. This is Virginia creeper. And so Virginia creeper has five leaflets. So often people are concerned if they see Virginia creeper, they may think that it's poison ivy, but if you can count five leaflets um, consistently, you can be assured that you're probably not looking at poison ivy. Um, and one thing that is curious to me, where scientific names become of interest, the quinquefolia, that would be five leaves, and the parthenocissus, yeah, they call it Virginia creeper, probably found in Virginia first, but parthenocissus means virgin vine. So Parthenon, the same as the Parthenon in, from the, you know, from the Greek, you know, Parthenon in Athens, and so, which would have been a temple for, of the virgins. And so this is the virgin vine, is uh, Parthenosis. Now, I'm uh, gonna jump to, to trees again for a second, because, you know, on our walk at Hawk Mountain, uh, we would encounter quite a bit of black birch Black birch is uh, also called cherry birch. Its scientific name is Betula lenta. And trees have to exchange oxygen with the external environment. And they do this through these pores in the bark that are called lenticels. But certain trees have very conspicuous lenticels. So cherries have conspicuous rows of lenticels. Black birch has these conspicuous rows of lenticels. But the leaves are different. You can see very fine toothing on the edge of the leaves. And if we were to take this branch and to scrape it, you would get the smell of uh, birch beer or oil of wintergreen. So for many, many years, black birch was the commercial source of oil of wintergreen. It's a chemical called methyl salicylate. It's typically added to uh, ointments that are meant when you have sore muscles. Uh, reading about it, the description is that they are antagonistic, you know, to offset the, uh, the cues that you're getting for painful muscles. Um, so that methyl salicylate would be an important chemical that's found in black birch. Uh, for birch beer, kind of a popular Pennsylvania drink, um, I, I was trying to read how one would make birch beer. But typically, you know, a recipe I found was that to have a few gallons of honey, you know, a few gallons of water. But one, the way to get the flavoring, they said, was to collect 60 branches and put them in water, boil them to extract the, the fragrance uh, or to, you know, to extract the essential oil and then incorporate that into the mix of honey and water 
to flavor it. So uh, Betula lenta is, you know, really a, a great plant. There's also reports that it would have been used for perhaps um, cleaning tooth teeth, you know, making sort of toothbrushes by uh, working, with the, working with the branches. Now, I want to show right after having shown Betula lenta, which it was the commercial source, source of oil of wintergreen, this is um, actual wintergreen or tea berry. Tea berry is a small shrub in the uh, same family as blueberries and huckleberries. Uh, mountain laurel, which are all common at Hawk Mountain, but this is its full size. This is a, a small shrub. It's woody, and that's as big as it gets. But that methyl salicylate and that oil of wintergreen was first extracted from this plant, from, from wintergreen or from tea berry. It's uh, more commonly called, I think, locally in, in this part of Pennsylvania. Um, it produces these fruits. So usually one or two fruits will dangle from uh, beneath the leaves during the fall, and these two would be uh, edible. A little bit waxy, not much flavor to them, a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of uh, wintergreen taste. So this is one that I have that I have tasted. Um, I gave one to a student last winter or last uh, fall. She took a bite and didn't look like she enjoyed it so much. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. But I put my watch in here just to show you the size of the plant. Um, also, locally, you can get tea berry ice cream. There are places uh, you know, where you can purchase tea berry ice cream, uh, which is kind of a Pennsylvania German treat, I believe. Now, uh, going to a shrub again, I want to go to mountain laurel. This is Calmia latifolia. Mountain laurel is the state flower of Pennsylvania. So this is what mountain laurel looks like right now up near Hawk Mountain. Um, so the, the flowers haven't begun to open yet, but if you look here, you'll see what the flower will look like, what the flowers will look like in just another week or two or three. And one of the things that's very interesting to me about mountain laurel flowers is that you have um, these anthers, these male reproductive structures are, um, are reflexed and held back in these little um, pits in the base of the flower. And what will happen is when an insect lands on this, a bee or a butterfly lands on this flower, what it does is it triggers these, these uh, stamens with the anthers and it triggers them and what they do is they throw the pollen at the side of the at the side of the animal. So the animal gets pelted with uh, a bunch of pollen that could then be carried to another plant. So if you're ever out in the woods and you see a plant uh, in flower, a mountain laurel plant in flower, take a look at the flower, take a pencil, something that you have any small sharp object and just um, stimulate this and release it and you'll see pollen get thrown across the flower. Now there is another plant in that same genus which can be found growing quite commonly at Hawk Mountain called sheep laurel. Mountain laurel probably grows to be you know three to four meters in height, um, you know up to perhaps 12 feet in height, but Calmia angustifolia would be two to three feet, maybe a meter in height. It has flowers that look similar but they are miniatures of the flowers and with a you know, much, you know, with, with a very different kind of coloration. So uh, I'm really curious to know what goes on with these. These don't seem to trigger quite as easily as the mountain laurel flowers, but they're just a beautiful plant. This is a photograph taken with a red maple leaf kind of interfering here with the image, but this was taken just a few days ago up near Hawk Mountain. And then this is the size of the plant, probably again, two to three feet in height. Uh, there is a plant that is similar to, um, you know, we, we have pachysandra that we use as a ground cover, but the pachysandra that's used in home landscapes is an introduced uh, plant. There is a plant in the same genus, pachysandra procumbens, 
is called Allegheny spurge. It occurs in, you know, it's planted in the native plant garden at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. And I've never actually seen it growing in nature. Reportedly, it comes from Pennsylvania, as well as a number of states. Uh, I had always heard that it was really quite abundant in um, West Virginia, parts of Virginia, but, uh, but looking at maps, it says it occurs in Pennsylvania, but I've yet to see it. It doesn't spread as aggressively as the Pachysandra, so it's not quite as effective a ground cover to give quick fill, but it's a great plant. It flowers very early in the growing season. So, you know, you get flowers at a time when not much else has, has begun to flower yet. This is rue anemone. This is a plant in the buttercup family. Flowers quite abundantly in Pennsylvania forests at this time of year. So I just wanted to show that part of being in the buttercup family, one of the traits of buttercups is to have lots of anthers. And this has been in flower probably for a month and a half, you know, almost two months. I'm still finding some in forests near my house. Um, plants, canopy trees that have been really quite common at Hawk Mountain. Yeah, you know, there would be red oaks. Red oaks are distinguished from other oaks I'll show you in a second, but the red oaks have pointed bristle tips on the tips of their leaves. And with red oaks, if you look at the bark, you'll usually see rough textured bark and smooth bark interspersed in between it. So red oaks produce acorns, incredibly valuable for lots of wildlife, turkeys, deer, chipmunks, squirrels, lots of animals depend on acorns. Now this is a white oak, Quercus alba, and with the white oaks, the white oaks have blunt tips on their leaves. So they're still a characteristic oak leaf shape. The bark looks very different from a red oak, um, from a red oak, from the red oak bark. And so these two produce acorns. But one of the things about the white oak acorns is that they germinate in the season when they fall to the ground. So as soon as the acorns of white oaks fall to the ground, they will germinate immediately. Whereas red oak acorns, just to go back to the red oak for a second, when it drops its acorns, its acorns need to overwinter and have a cold treatment before they germinate in the spring. And then I'm gonna show you one more plant that is in the white oak uh, subgenus. It has blunt tips, but this is called chestnut oak, Quercus prinus. It has very rough, almost quirky type bark. This is a very common tree at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. Uh, great acorns, great wildlife plant. And the acorns would germinate immediately as soon as they fall to the ground in the fall. Maple leaf viburnum is another plant in flower right now. Um, it has leaves that look very much like maples, but it's a shrub, probably doesn't get much taller than uh, you know, six feet, two meters, maybe six, eight feet, two to three meters in height. And it has these open flowers. It produces blue fruit, blue to black fruit in fall. Uh, the fruit in fall is not very rich, but birds will take it. So it's, it's a good wildlife uh, plant. Um, at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, you would find a number of different types of blueberries. Uh, the soils are quite acidic. I mentioned earlier that they're rocky, they drain quite a lot, you know, so they're, they're pretty dry. And it turns out that uh, one of the blueberries that occurs there is called deerberry. Deerberry can get to be probably two to three meters in height. These are the flowers of deerberry in flower right now, and they produce a rather large fruit. And as their name uh, implies, deer do consume the fruits, and they do browse on uh, they do browse on the stems. And so this is also a plant that would be available to to birds. Uh, actually, let me go back. And these are blueberries as well. This is there are low bush blueberries high bush blueberries. Um, the other species, the low bush and the high bush blueberries, have these urn-shaped flowers. And then 
just a few days ago, I took this photograph of the fruits just beginning to mature. So this would be a uh, summer, you know, a summer maturing, early summer maturing fruit that is sugar rich. Canada Mayflower is another uh, spring ephemeral and it has these attractive white flowers, but it's a small plant, probably not much, uh, doesn't get much taller than perhaps even at, when flowering, maybe two or three inches in, in height. And it spreads by sending underground stems called rhizomes. And so you can find big patches of, uh, of Canada Mayflower. So this is a plant that you would find uh, in forests in southeastern Pennsylvania at this time of year and should still be in flower. Uh, this is a plant called bloodroot and bloodroot is a plant, uh, the genus is Sanguinaria canadensis. Uh, this is a leaf, but the leaf shapes can be quite variable. Uh, I tore one leaf so that you could see the sap of this plant is orange or reddish in color. This is a picture of the flower, but the flowers open up more than this and they can be much more attractive than that photo reflects. But the flowers are pretty short lived, you know, so you have to look for them early in the year and they'll drop their, they'll drop their sepals, their petals pretty quickly. Um, bloodroot is a plant that a lot of people report have it as having medicinal uses but it has alkaloids in it and they can be quite toxic. Uh, there are some people who report that in very small quantities, they can be used in like um, health food store toothpastes, but there are also warnings about whether it could cause precancerous growths in your mouth. So I would be very careful about paying attention to medicinal uses of blood root. Uh, this is pinkster flower. Pinkster flower is a rhododendron. It's an azalea. And so with these long tubular flowers, these are visited by both hummingbirds. You can see these long reproductive structures. So you'd have to have a rather large animal reaching into this flower with a long tongue to extract nectar from, from the flower. And so they, you know, the reports are that Hummingbirds and butterflies are typical pollinators of pinkster flower. This is Columbine, Aquilegia canadensis. And with Aquilegia canadensis, uh, there are two kind of interesting uh, traits of this. The Aquilegia, that comes from Aquila, that comes from Eagle. And you actually have what looks like the talons of an eagle. I think this was suggestive to somebody. And then Columbine, I'm not sure if it's the, uh, the shape of the leaves or the leaflets, but the Columbiformes is the genus for the pigeons and for doves. And so a common name refers perhaps somewhat to doves and the scientific name refers to predatory birds, eagles. Um, This is sarsaparilla, and sarsaparilla is a plant that occurs quite commonly at Hawk Mountain. Um, it's, it usually flowers, the, the flowering stalk has no leaves on it. So the nudicollis means, you know, that the stem of the flowers has no leaves on it. Um, this is not the same plant as the commercial source of sarsaparilla, which is a South American plant but people did use the roots of this plant as a source of flavoring uh, that would have been sarsaparilla-like. Now, I also put in this picture that these plants are browsed very heavily by deer. And so if you walk through the forest right now, a lot of them will be trimmed. You know, both the leaves and the flowers would be trimmed by deer. Um, I'm gonna talk about Jack in the Pulpit and then I'll tell Jamie she can cut in at any point, because we're getting close to our time. Actually, Chris, I think we have a question about what the plant you were just talking about. The question is, is it edible? Is it edible? Again, I think um, people would have used the root for flavoring, um, you know, to, to develop 
the beverage. So in old time Western movies, they'll talk about source barilla. And so uh, the real source of the flavoring that would have made that beverage would have been a plant from South America. This one, I believe that the root would have provided that flavoring. Um, I've not read about exactly how you would extract that, how you would do that. Um, for Jack in the Pulpit, Jack in the Pulpit is interesting because uh, several years ago, there were a number of researchers, probably in the 1980s, there were researchers who worked with the reproductive strategy of Jack in the Pulpit, and they actually uh, recommended in one publication, they called it Jack and Jill in the Pulpit. And so you could have non-flowering individuals, small non-flowering individuals. As the plant grows in size, it can be a male flower first. And so this is the pulpit. This is a uh, a shape of a flower that's characteristic of plants in the family that contains Jack in the pulpit. And these would be anthers. I peeled away the uh, spathe and you could see that these are the male structures. But then for another plant, when they get even larger, usually with two large leaves emerging from the ground, you can get a plant that's in a female phase. And these would be the pistillate flowers that would give rise to fruits. So um, it's a plant that can be non-flowering, can be flowering as a male, can be flowering as a female. And sometimes the cost of producing fruits might be so substantial that the plant goes back the next year and it's smaller as it grows and it may be in a male phase. A male phase plant may go back to a non-flowering phase. So these plants are flexible in terms of their reproductive strategy. Uh, this is wild ginger, which is found commonly in Pennsylvania forests. Um, it's called wild ginger because people would have harvested the below ground stems and they said that they would add sugar and cook it and it had a bit of a ginger taste. This is not related to the, to the ginger that we consume in our kitchens today, but it would have had a flavor somewhat like that. So it was um, something where it was almost like a, a candy, a sweet that people would make with sugar and with that root. And one thing I like to point out about this plant is that the flower is very inconspicuous. You have to dig beneath the leaves to find the flowers. And then the flowers are somewhat maroon. And often, I don't know about this particular plant for sure, but often maroon flowers are associated with fly pollination. So flies can be attracted to flowers like this. Sometimes they smell bad too, and they would be uh, rotting meat mimics. Although I really haven't sensed that with the wild ginger, but there are other plants that mimic rotting meats and attract flies. This has the coloration of a, of a meat mimic, but it doesn't have the smell in my, in my experience. So I'm not quite sure what pollinates this, but I do think it's worth digging beneath the leaves these are kind of the, the roundish leaves here are the wild ginger leaves. Um, you can call it now, Jamie, if you want, or... You, you can keep going if you want. Sure, okay. I've got a few more to go. So another, this would be an, un, an understory tree, a sub canopy or an understory tree. Flowering dogwood is one of the, the great ornamental plants that come from native forests. And so it turns out it flowers beautifully in the spring. Um, I've put these leaves in just to show that the leaves have these veins that run out to the edge of the leaf somewhat parallel to one another. They turn, the leaves turn a beautiful red in fall and they also produce a fruit in fall that's very rich in oils and lipids, just like the spice bush that would make them very attractive to migratory birds. But one thing I wanted to point out about the flower is that this is actually an inflorescence. This is a cluster of flowers and the structure that look like petals, these are modified leaves and these modified leaves are called bracts. The individual flowers in the flowering dogwood have essentially lost their petals. So they individually are not attractive to the insects but these bracts, these modified leaves, are attractive. So this is similar to poinsettia that you might see in December at, 
at the hot Christmas holiday time. Um, so those leaves turn color to attract pollinators. And in this case, these modified leaves, these bracts turn this beautiful whitish color to surround these inflorescence with individual flowers that don't have their own petals to be attractive. Um, so flowering dogwood is a great component of the forest understory of the subcanopy. Another plant that's very common uh, at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary is witch hazel. And this is Hamamelis virginiana. Witch hazel, actually we would have had to have met last fall to talk about when it's in flower. It's one of the latest flowering plants, perhaps the latest flowering woody plant in Pennsylvania. So it flowers in fall, it begins to set fruits, but it will take almost an entire year from the time that it flowers. This is a, a fruit that is maturing now and the seeds would disperse probably sometime in October or November. So this fruit would take perhaps almost a full year to mature. The leaves are uh, oyster shell shaped is the way that some people describe them. And um, the, the astringent that people use is derived from the bark of witch hazel. So you would have to strip the bark, you would let it sit in water, boil it, and then filter it, and you could probably add some alcohol to it, and it would become the astringent that people use as, um, you know, for acne or for an aftershave. So, um, you know, I've had people on my tours who have told me that they've made that astringent. I never, I, I haven't done that yet. But um, there have been a number of questions recently as, as I was looking, preparing for this talk, um, people are asking if it is an antiseptic and it turns out it's not. So this wouldn't be something that you would use uh, to clean surfaces if you were hoping to fight the coronavirus. So uh, it's an astringent, it's something that has many uses within, within homes for skincare, but again, probably not something you would use if you were looking for an antiseptic, if you're looking for something to clean surfaces. Um, hepatica, this is one of the earliest flowering plants. I keep saying there are a lot of early flowering plants. This is definitely one of the earliest flowering plants. I've seen this in March in flower. It's a beautiful flower. Um, this would be the leaf of hepatica. And the hepatica name comes from hepatic is associated with the liver. And the liver is a three-lobed organ. So this would be a three-lobed leaf that for some botanist is reminiscent of the shape of the liver. This is twin leaf. Twin leaf is a plant, it's an honorific, uh, it's got an honorific name. It's named after Thomas Jefferson. It's Jeffersonia diphylla. It's in the poppy family. The flowers are very short-lived. It does fine in home gardens, but if you don't go into your garden for a week, you may miss it flowering for the entire year. So you have to be checking right around the time when you know it's going to be in flower and it's got a beautiful flower. And this is what the leaves look like. These, you know, lobed leaves, these twin leaves are what would happen several weeks after the plant completes flowering. Um, these are irises. This is dwarf crested iris. And this is a plant that would occur sometimes on dry slopes going into moister areas. The plant might only be four or five inches in height. And so it's a very small plant with a beautiful flower. This is Northern Blue Flag, Iris Versicolor. This is a plant that occurs near streams, near rivers, near ponds in Pennsylvania. So these are both plants that can be really wonderful ornamental plants in home gardens. And then this is golden seal. Golden seal is, I believe, also in the buttercup family. It's a plant that reportedly has some medicinal uses, very early flowering, essentially at almost at the same time as the Jeffersonia diphylla, the, um, the twin, twin leaf, but these flowers last a longer time. And then eventually they produce a beautiful red fruit that would be attractive to wildlife. Um, 
So I think I'm going to stop right there, Jamie. Wonderful. Chris, that was such an amazing presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I kind of felt like I was back at the mountain hiking on the trails, uh, seeing all these gorgeous plants. So thank you. Thank you. We have so many questions. We have several questions. Um, so do you want to uh, end the screen share so people can see your face? Sure. Like, yep. Answering all of our questions. I'm going to stop um, sharing now. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. So we'll do our best to get through as many questions as we can because there are a lot. There's a lot of interest. Okay. So Chris, we have questions about um, plant reproduction. So let me just get to this question. So can you explain why some of the plants are male and female? Okay, so um, with flowering plants, uh, they're probably the, the primitive, well, within the flowering plants, the primitive form would have been to have both male and female structures within a single flower. And then over time, there were plants that um, through normal genetic variation would probably have um, lost either male structures or female structures and that became an efficient way to reproduce, an effective way to reproduce. So for instance, willows are, you know, have separate male and female plants and so females might occupy a place within the environment where they're, you know, they've got more access to resources. Female reproduction is often more costly than male reproduction. The cost of producing fruits and seeds or abundant seeds in a willow, um, that is, you know, that is costly enough that you actually have the plants um, developing, you know, developing single genders. Probably only 10% of flowering plants have two different, two different, um, two different sexes, you know, uh, so male and female. More often you find that both male and female parts are on the same plant. And there is a risk with a lot of plants. If you have self-fertilization, you can actually have deleterious effects on your offspring. So separating male and female separating male and female structures ensures that you'll get outcrossing. But at the same time, 90% of plants, you know, 88 to 90% of plants do have both sexes on the same individual. So there have got to be benefits for having for having that um, for having that reproductive strategy. Thank you. Um, that's sure, certainly is a complex topic. Um, and a kind of like a, a kind of similar question. We have questions about um, berries. So when you have a plant that has berries, um, would that be uh, more so the, the female part of the plant versus the male? Okay. So um, for something like blueberries, blueberries produce berries. Berries are fleshy fruits that have multiple seeds in them. And a flower, a blueberry flower will have both male and female parts in the same flower. So after the plant has an opportunity to disperse pollen, then it will have an opportunity to act as a female to receive pollen and to then produce uh, fruits and seeds. So it's probably or probably a more effective strategy to uh, be able to produce fruits because fruits lead to seeds and then those seeds are how the plant is going to, to reproduce ultimately. So there's, you know, there's a high benefit of um, ultimately having fruits produced. But yeah, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty challenging. People are asking good questions. These, these are good questions and there's so many. I feel like I need to apologize because I know we're not going to have time to get through all of them. Um, so when you were showing the slide about poison ivy versus Virginia creeper, is Virginia creeper poisonous? No, it's not. And that's, you know, that's one of the, um, you know, one of the reasons why people, people can be concerned because they may think it's poison ivy, but they would not, they would not um, get skin, skin irritation. I mean, uh, 
perhaps, you know, there might be a person who has like a very high sensitivity to certain plant um, hairs or something like that. But in general, Virginia creeper is not, uh, is not something that would cause skin irritation. It's, you know, it's a, a good native plant that can be used. If you have a place where you can have vines that climb, it produces fruits that attract birds and it, you know, the leaves turn red in the fall. But again, vines can be a problem in home gardens because sure. they can then start to spread. Thank you. Um, quick question. Do Jack in the pulpit have berries? Actually, they do. And so they, they have fruits that um, are attractive to wildlife. Uh, a person should not consume Jack in the pulpit fruits because uh, even in the fruits, Jack in the pulpit produce uh, a chemical oxalic acid crystals, which can cause kind of constriction of your tongue and your throat if you consume it. Um, but somehow birds are able to consume them uh, without effect, without, you know, without having the same effect that it might have on a number of mammals. Thank you. So I feel we can't do this presentation without uh, talking a little bit about invasive plants. Um, okay. Someone brought that up uh, as, as a question. Um, it does Hawk Mountain specifically have problems with invasives? And I, I can tell you that our stewardship team spends a lot of time trying to manage and eliminate invas invasive plants. And maybe uh, Chris wants to come on that, comment on that as well. And also, Chris, I was wondering if you could just comment to the audience how uh, individual um, choices people make for their home landscaping can really impact uh, wildlife conservation and uh, the environment. Sure. So uh, at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, as with all natural areas, they're vulnerable to invasion by uh, species that did not originate in North America. So uh, some of the plants were deliberately introduced. And so uh, garlic mustard is one of the really problematic ones. It's pretty easy to extract, but once it, uh, once it becomes established, if it spreads seeds, those seeds can persist in the seed bank. So they can survive in the soils for many years. So even if you're pulling living plants, you would have to come back the next year to harvest those plants again. And I believe Hawk Mountain has sometimes organized groups of people to go out and harvest uh, garlic mustard. Now, uh, another plant that's really problematic, there, there are a couple, but one of the plants that's really problematic is Japanese barberry, which is still sold in, uh, still sold in nurseries or sold at uh, nursery outlets associated with big box stores. And it produces fruits. Birds will take those fruits drop them into forests and they've become, it's become a real problem to try to extract those. The problems with these invasive species is that they displace natives. They do not have the same value to native animals. So uh, it can actually harm native animals to have these non-native species invading uh, forested areas. So definitely, um, if I could say two species to avoid, one of them would be uh, Japanese barberry. Uh, another would be uh, burning bush also invades. Uh, so burning bush, also called euonymus, but all of, you know, all of the non-native euonymuses can be very invasive. They have bird dispersed fruits and they can get into forests. And I know that the the team at Hawk Mountain spent a lot of time last summer doing um, invasive plant extraction and then replacing those. One of the really important um, decisions to make is not just to remove plants and hope for the best, remove the invasives and hope for the best with recolonization by natives, but I believe that they were introducing some plantings of native plants to give them a jump before the non-native plants uh, recovered and became problems again. Thank you so much. And also I have to say Hawk Mountain every year, we have two native plant sales in the spring and also in the fall. And we have such a fantastic 
group of very dedicated uh, volunteers that manage and run our uh, native habitat garden. So thank you to, to all those volunteers. Um, and so again, apologies, we're not getting to all the questions, but Chris, one last quick fun question for you. What is your favorite flower? What is my favorite flower? Oh my gosh, that's a tough one. Yes. I'm going to say Calmia latifolia. Yeah, you know, I, I really love mountain laurel. Mountain. And I think it's, you know, it's got, you know, wonderful attributes and it's a beautiful plant and you can come up to the sanctuary and hike and, you know, see it in all its glory. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And three cheers for mountain laurel. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, Chris, thank you for an amazing presentation. It was fantastic. And a huge thank you as well to all of our viewers for joining us today. It really means a lot to us that you take the time to join us virtually. And um, some other programs we have coming up soon. We have on Thursday, tomorrow, June 4th, Rosalie Edge, Raptor Hero at 1 o'clock p.m. This Friday, June 5th, we have Voyages of the Snowy Owl at 4 o'clock p.m. Next Wednesday, June 10th, we have Slithering Snakes at 1 o'clock p.m. And next Thursday, June 11th, Sanctuary Storytime, Percy the Victorious Vulture. And next Friday, June 12th, we have Galaxy of Falcons with Scott Widensall at 4 o'clock p.m. So thank you so much. Have a fantastic day, and we hope to see you again soon. Hey, Bye thank you very much. Appreciate it, Jamie. <laughs>